Hi, I'm Steve Wagner, and this is a brief lecture on evidence-based management. I'll start out talking about what evidence-based management is, and then I'll review some essential research concepts that are important for evidence-based management. I'll wrap up by providing a summary and also giving you some references that you could use to further explore evidence-based management. The basic premise of evidence-based management is that we should be basing business processes and decisions on valid data and facts, that we should use scientific analysis to critically evaluate research and then use that research in the businesses that we manage. There's two main areas of evidence-based management as I see it. The first is organization-focused evidence. Here, managers use information from within the business to gauge how effective operations are. We can also get evidence about management practices from different disciplines like organizational behavior, human resource management, supply chain management, accounting, uh, or, or the other disciplines within the field of business. We live in a time of rapid change because of globalization, because of technological changes. Our routine practices may not be useful and may need to be changed. Okay, we can rely on our intuition, our gut feeling, but often that is misleading. We can call in expert consultants, but oftentimes they're wrong. And so we live in an age of information. If we have valid data and we can analyze it in a rational way, we can make better decisions. We can sell those decisions with effective persuasive appeals. And we can have more confidence in those decisions even if we don't have all of the information we need to be 100% confident. As a manager, you live in an age of accountability. Using scientific processes and understanding scientific concepts helps you to be more accountable in the decisions that you make, to provide evidence that will stand up to the scrutiny of others. It's evidence that is more objective. It's derived through systematic experimentation. It is quantified information that you can utilize tools like statistics to make decisions with. It helps you to predict what's going to happen in your business. It helps you to explain the processes that underlie your business. Uh, one type of research design through which we can gather evidence is a case study. This is where we look at an, uh, an organization in its naturally occurring state and we focus in on, on one organization and record what is happening in that organization. Uh, case studies are very useful because they provide very descriptive information and it helps us to examine different situational contingencies within organizations. Now we have to temper the conclusions we make from case studies because we are typically just examining one organization and we have to question whether that's a good representation of all organizations. We also have to understand that there are limitations of the person writing the case study. And so we cannot reach strong cause and effect conclusions from case studies. Another type of research design that will talk about in this class is an experiment. In an experiment, we have a researcher who is manipulating conditions in a highly controlled setting. So typically there is some group we call the treatment group that is uh, receiving some type of training or uh, has their experience changed in some way and they they are compared to a control group a group that does not experience the treatment the training um, the intervention 
or whatever that change is. The difference between the treatment and the control group is, is what we consider that independent variable. The experimenter then tries to make everything else that is experienced by the treatment and control group equal. And so all other things besides the independent variable are considered extraneous variables. So one thing that researchers do is assign subjects randomly to either the treatment or the control group. By doing this, it eliminates all of those characteristics that people bring in to the experimental setting and spreads them out equally across the treatment in the control group, thereby making these two groups equal. We want the only thing that is unequal between two groups to be whether they receive the treatment or they don't. After this is set up, there is some outcome that is measured. This outcome is the dependent variable. The big advantage of an experiment is that it allows us to reach strong cause and effect conclusions when the experiment is done correctly. Now the disadvantage of an experiment is that they're generally conducted in very artificial situations. And so while we'll read about uh, experiments, um, sometimes they'll be criticized because they don't generalize well to a business setting. Now much of the research that we'll be reading about in this course are, are correlational studies. So in uh, a correlational study, uh, like we are in a case study, we're looking at variables in a natural environment. We're not manipulating a situation. But uh, we do tend to use more extensive methods of measurement of variables in a correlational study. We're not simply relying uh, on an observer in most cases. We might be using questionnaires. We might be using objective measures of performance. Now, the advantage here, again, is that, that we are in a real organizational environment and we can examine how variables are related in a real organizational environment. And the, the, another advantage is that uh, we're getting a number that reflects the relationship between these variables. Now the disadvantage, like the disadvantage with the case study, is that typically we can't reach strong cause and effect conclusions in a correlational study. Now since most of the research we're going to be looking at in this course is correlational in nature, you should understand the correlation coefficient. This is the number that quantifies the relationship between variables. A correlation coefficient can range in value between negative 1 and positive 1. The sign of the correlation, negative or positive, represents the direction of the relationship. When we have a positive correlation, this means that as one variable increases, the other variable increases. A negative sign in a correlation signifies that as one variable increases, the other variable decreases. We can also look at the absolute value of the correlation, how close it is to a value of 1. This represents the strength of the correlation or the predictive power of the correlation. Small correlations uh, that have generally weak predictive power are correlations that are less than an absolute value of 0.3. Moderate correlations have an absolute value that ranges between 0.3 and 0.6. Strong correlations, those with very strong predictive power, are correlations that are greater than 0.6. Just because we have a correlation that is small, it does not mean that it is not significant. When we talk about statistical significance, um, this has to do uh, not just with the size of the correlation, but also with the sample size, how many uh, observations this correlation is based on. It also, a small correlation doesn't mean that it's not an important correlation. Um, we have to look at the variables that we're trying to predict. 
if we're talking about serious accidents in an organization that might have consequences for people's health and large financial consequences for organizations, we probably want to pay attention to even small correlations as long as they are statistically significant. Now here I've got an example of a positive correlation for you. This correlation represents the relationship between job satisfaction and job performance. So we've got job satisfaction along the horizontal axis, and this is paired up with job performance on the vertical axis. So you can see that uh, when people have low job satisfaction, they tend to have lower job performance. And when people have higher job satisfaction, they tend to have higher job performance. Again, we can't conclude from this evidence alone that there's a causal relationship between job satisfaction and job performance. We can't say that a happy worker is a productive worker. It could be that a productive worker is a happy worker. Or it could be that there is some other variable, a third variable, that causes both of these variables to be related. It might be that having uh, goals that are aligned with the organization's goals is very satisfying and leads to better job performance. And so it could be that a third variable causes this positive relationship. Now next we can see uh, a negative correlation. Here on the horizontal axis we've got the variable for organizational commitment, how much you identify with the organization as a person. And on the vertical axis we've got uh, a person's intention to search for another job. And we can see that this represents a, a negative correlation. As one variable goes up, as organizational commitment goes up, the other variable goes down. Job search intentions go down as organizational commitment goes up. This uh, is, is not just a, a correlation that differs in terms of its direction. It also differs in terms of its strength. This is a stronger correlation than the correlation we looked at on the last slide. And you can see that the cluster of data points on the scatter plot are more tightly grouped together and the linear trend, the line that is the trend here is, is more clearly decipherable and therefore we can, it has a stronger correlation it has more predictive power. Now the last research concept I'd like for you to be familiar with is the concept of meta-analysis. In uh, the field of organizational behavior there are tens of thousands of studies that are done and sometimes it's difficult to understand what conclusion should be drawn from all of these studies. Uh, Meta-analysis is, is a process by which we can take the findings of different studies on a, on a particular topic and combine their results and come up with one large study that helps us to understand a phenomenon in organizational behavior. It also it helps us to understand why different studies come up with different results. Now there's, there's a couple of reasons why different studies have different results. Uh, one has to do with it uh, research artifacts. Research artifacts refers to the fact that some studies are higher quality than other studies. Some use larger samples and therefore have less sampling error. Some use better measures and therefore have less measurement unreliability. So one reason that one study finds something different than another study could be related to the quality of the research. And what meta-analysis does is gives more weight to those higher quality studies than the lower quality studies. So once we've controlled for research artifacts, we can look for other reasons why studies might differ from one another. It might be the type of organization. Uh, one might be a nonprofit organization, another might be a for-profit organization. There might be different sample characteristics. One study might be looking at service occupations, another might be looking at non-service occupations. So in summary, uh, as a manager, you need to understand how to evaluate evidence in vari for 
various business practices. And this evidence often comes from different research studies. These studies can often be complex, but you can understand quite a bit of them if you have basic knowledge of scientific concepts. Now, if you'd like to examine more on evidence-based management, I'd like to recommend two different books to you. One is by uh, Latham from 2009. It's called Becoming the Evidence-Based Manager. Uh, and the other is by Pfeffer and Sutton. Uh, from 2006. This is called Hard Facts, Dangerous Half-Truths, and Total Nonsense, Profiting from Evidence-Based Management.